Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Awesome. Welcome to Grace Church. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for being, whether you're in person or you're joining us online, we are glad that you're gathered with us this morning. Uh, do keep our women in prayer as they're coming back. Uh, they're on their way now home. They had to check out at 10 a.m., so they're on their way back from Myrtle Beach from their beach retreat, and I look forward to hearing good stories about what God did while they were meeting together. Last week, uh, we did a, uh, started just a short series called Our Confidence, and we're in Psalms 46.10, and I want to just ask if you want to have your Bible app or your Bible, go ahead and turn there to Psalm 46, uh, Psalms 46, and it's a short psalm that's divided into three sections, and you can recognize the sections because each section ends with the word Selah, S-E-L-A-H, and there are many different kinds of psalms. There are psalms that are confessional. There are psalms that are giving praise. There are psalms that express trust to God. Uh, there are psalms that express a, a desire for God to judge the enemies of whoever that may be. They're called imprecatory. Uh, maybe you prayed some imprecatory prayers. I don't know. Uh, this psalm kind of has a, certainly a strong element of trust in it, but it is a psalm that expresses confidence in God. And confidence is important, isn't it? That would mean yes, yeah, right? Yeah, you've got to have some confidence, right? You're not confident in your confidence, right? You know, there is a, it, it's a world of difference between having confidence and being kind of insecure and timid. When we are confident, we, we I don't know, we just feel more assured, more steady. We're, there's just something in our demeanor that changes when we have confidence. But it also shows when we have a lack of confidence. And and confidence is very important, not just confidence in God, but just, I mean, confidence is important to our daily life. I mean, if you have a car that you wouldn't trust to drive an hour somewhere, you certain, certainly wouldn't hop in it to drive to Disney World, would you? Not at all. You have no confidence in it. If you have someone telling you something that you have no confidence in, you're not going to take their word and run with it and, and do anything about it, are you? No, because you don't have any confidence in them. If you have your money... You, you, you have a financial advisor, and you don't have any confidence. How long are you going to keep your money with him? Not long, right? Y'all are quiet this morning. Where are the women at? Oh, they're on their way back. That's right. No, uh, and, and it's not just that, but listen, uh, look, let's just strike to the real heart of the matter. If you have children, would you leave your child or your children with someone that you have no confidence in? Absolutely not. No way, no how. I mean, the bottom line is this. Confidence matters in life. And I'm not trusting myself. I'm not trusting my family. And I am not trusting my possessions to something or someone I do not trust. Now, what is the basis for confidence? Because we need to have confidence. What is the basis for it? Well, the psalmist tells us we're going to do a quick rehash of last week as we head into what the psalmist says now. He says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble, right? So the word our is very important here because this is a collective uh, testimony, a shared experience of God's people who can all acknowledge, who can all confess, who can all testify, who all have confidence because they have found in their lives that God is indeed our refuge, He is indeed our strength, that God is indeed an ever-present help in trouble. And all God's people said, Amen. He is. He is that. And because of that, we have confidence because of who God is. That gives us confidence, our refuge, our strength, and ever-present help in trouble. And this is important because when he goes to the next verse, he says, therefore, because this is who God is, this is where our confidence is at, therefore, he says, we will not fear. You know, there's this contrast here between confidence in God and fear. Fear about what's happening in our world. And listen to what he describes. He says, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Selah. So there's this amazing contrast between confidence in God and fear in our circumstances and what is happening around us. Things are chaotic. The world is falling apart, quite literally, in this description here. And if that's where you are and you don't have confidence in God, 
You don't know what to believe. You don't know what to trust. You don't know. There's nothing firm or secure for you to have confidence in. But the reason for our confidence is God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. That doesn't do away with our problems, does it? No. It just means that we have the greatest resource. I love this. We have the absolute greatest resource to us right here, right now, no matter what is going on in our life. And our resource is God. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And that gives us confidence even when there is chaos going on. Even when we have reason to fear, and many times we have reasons to fear, but we don't have to because of our God. Now he continues. We're on the second section now today. He continues, and I love what he says here. He kind of changes the, the picture. He says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Now, when we read this, if, if you have no Bible background, I'm not, this is, it's just, you might read this and you might think, this means absolutely nothing to me. Well, how does this affect my life? And that's a very good question. And I, I want to try to help explain why what it's saying here is so important to us today. In the previous verse, the psalmist had talked about the chaotic waters, the waters that were destructive. But now he says there is a river, there is some water whose streams make glad the city of God, the place where the Most High God dwells. Now, what city is this speaking about? Jerusalem. When this was written, it was speaking about the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place where the temple was built, remember? Jerusalem was the place where God uh, made his name known, where his presence dwelt in the temple. And at one time, this is so important, at one time it was all about location. If you wanted to draw near to God, it was about location. If you wanted to seek God for forgiveness of sins, it was about location. If you wanted to draw near to God and be close to Him, it was about location. And people would make pilgrimage to a place, to a location to draw near to God. But here's the beautiful thing. Because of Jesus, it has all changed. It's not about location. It's not about place. It's about people. Because God through Christ, has transformed. It's not a temple place. It's a temple people. We are the people of God. We, as believers in Jesus, we are the city of God. We are the temple, he says, Paul writes, of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in us. And so, this is so important to understanding what he's saying here about these, this river whose strings make glad the city of God because he is speaking to us as believers in Jesus. And Jesus was very clear about this. See, it all changed with Jesus. It's about, it's about Him, the head of the church, and us, His body. It's about, it's about the church in whom Jesus dwells. And in Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead, Godhead dwells. It's about you and me, the God who dwells in us. Because Jesus dwells in us. We have access. We have provision. There is a river in us, a stream that flows and it makes glad the people of God. Jesus talks about this. He said, whoever believes in me, in John 7.38, whoever believes in me, listen to what he says. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, Streams of living water will flow from within him. Don't you love that? Do you notice the location? It's not a place. It's in people who believe in Jesus. It's within you when you believe in Jesus. He puts within us a stream of living water that flows from within and what does a river do? A water brings refreshment. See, it's provision. It's life. 
It brings refreshment. It brings renewal. It brings satisfaction. You ever been really, really thirsty and you got yourself a nice glass of ice cold water and you're like, and oh, it was so satisfying? This is the picture of what Jesus is saying. What happens when we put our faith and our trust in him? A river begins to flow from within us and it comes from God himself because it is God who is at the source of it. You know, the human problem, our problem, what we typically do is we tend to look to other things to bring that satisfaction, to bring that rest, to bring that refreshment, and to bring that renewal. We look to things to do that for us, to satisfy us, that are created, that are good things. Oftentimes, we look to good things to try to give us this, this deep, to satisfy the deep longing of our hearts. And the problem is that created things were never meant to satisfy the deep longings of our heart. That part is reserved for God and God alone in Christ. And that's why all the good things in the world, no matter how good they are, can never fully satisfy you and me. Because we were meant for God himself. And that's where our satisfaction comes from. When we drink deep of him and the life that he gives to us. Jesus spoke to this. He was talking with a woman at a well. She was trying to get some physical water to, to continue her physical life. And we need physical water for life, right? Absolutely, we've got to have that. Well, Jesus is talking to her about a completely different kind of water. And apparently she had been looking to other things to try to satisfy her soul. Jesus is talking to her and he's like, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have one. He goes, you're right. You've had five and the man you're living with now isn't your own husband. And, and, and it's, it's almost like she was looking for validation. She was looking for love. She was looking for something that could affirm her worth. I don't know if that's the totality of her life or what, but clearly that was a part of it. And then Jesus says to her, look, you're drinking this water. You're going to thirst again. But listen to what he says in John 4, 14. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become where? In him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Listen to what this means. Gladness does not come from without. It comes from within when we put our faith and trust in Jesus because Jesus begins to dwell in us. And it isn't about our circumstances. It's about God who works in our lives, who is within us. This is the gift of God. And it's why true gladness can never be found outside of him, but only within him. Gladness that refreshes, renews, restores, and satisfies our soul. Do you know what he's saying here? The water that he gives, it, there's never a lack. There's always plenty of provision. It's always bubbling. It's always flowing. It never lacks. It never fails. It never runs dry. It can't be cut off. It can't be shut off. Do you hear what I'm saying? There is this constant stream because Christ is in our hearts that flows from within us, that, uh, that overflows. It flows freely. And you're not going to find that water anywhere but in him. <laughs> this is why we can have confidence. God is our provision. He provides for us. He gives us provision. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And it is the place where the Most High dwells. This is so important. Listen to what he says here. Verse 5. God is within her. Who is her? You and me, if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. God is within her. She will not fall. God is within her. She will not fall. I have been gnawing on this psalm for about three or four weeks now. And there were multiple times when I would read this psalm and I would think about it and I would come to this and I would read the first words here, God is within her, she will not fall. And something inside me would just absolutely break in gratitude. Some of you need to hear this today. God is with you. God is within you. Whatever your circumstances may be, you will not fall. Because God is with you.
there are times when we feel like we're going to fall. There are times we feel like we're not going to make it. There are times when we feel like God's not going to come through in time, that he's not listening to our prayers. But listen again to what it says. God is within her. She will not fall. Let that settle into your heart. Let that settle into your spirit. When times are difficult, when problems are overwhelming, when circumstances seem impossible to overcome, God is within you and me. And he said, I'm not going to let you fall. Isn't that beautiful? You know why? Because Jesus is within his people. He's within his body. He's within his church. And he is the one who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God completes the work that he starts in us. God is within her. She will not fall. That means we can have confidence. We should have confidence confidence. Jesus is with us. He is within us. And there is no power in hell that can separate us from his love. What, I I ask this honestly, what would happen if we really, truly, genuinely believe this? That because God is with us and God is within us, we will not fall. How would it change our life? How would it change how we live our life? How would it change how we respond to our circumstances if we really, really believe this truth that God is within her? She will not fall. How would it change us? Paul was thinking about it, and he says, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? My friends, we have reason to have confidence in spite of whatever is happening on in our life and whatever is happening in our world. We have reason to be confident because it doesn't matter what's against us. What matters is who is for us. And if God be for you, what does it matter who's against you? God is for us. God is for you. He has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. He has not cast you aside. Hear me on this, church. Hear me on this. Lift up your heads. Lift up your heart. Strengthen your feeble knees. Jesus has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. He is God with us. God is within her. She will not fall. Listen to this next part. God will help her at break of day. God will help her at break of day. You know what that means? That means there's going to be some nights. Nights that are going to be oppressive. They're going to seem to be that they're enduring nights and they're not going to yield to anything. (laughs) But God says that darkness is going to have to give way to the dawn that his light is going to pierce the darkness that surrounds you and that darkness is going to have to dissipate. And out of nowhere, a light is going to be shining and the darkness will be gone. And God shows up, God shows off. He reveals his mighty and strong arm for you and for me. And he reminds us that he is the God of our salvation. Let that settle deep in your heart and your spirit today. If it seems dark, don't lose heart. God is with you. He will not let you fall. And he will help you at the break of day. Don't cast aside your confidence in him. He will do what he said he will do. And he looked around, and it is what the psalmist realized at this moment in time as he's saying these things. He says, nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall but he lifts his voice and the earth melts. What a a powerful description of our God. And you know, we're seeing some of this today, aren't we? Our nation's in uproar. We thought politics was bad. 
now Ruth Bader Ginsburg is dead, it's about to get a whole lot worse. There were people who complained that people were just one-issue voters, and now we've got going to have a whole lot of people who are going to be one-issue voters. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. Listen, kingdoms falling is a very big deal. If you've ever read, if you've seen history, documentaries or whatever about kingdoms that fall, it creates chaos. It creates disorder. And oftentimes in place of that, what was bad is replaced with something far worse. This is not a pretty picture here. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall, but he lifts his voice and the earth melts. God was speaking to his people, and they were going through a difficult place, and here's what he says. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed. When I was reading this, I have to tell you from Isaiah, my mind went to a song. I think it's Jerry Lee Lewis. A whole lot of shaking going on. See, that's old school, but I think most people in here would know that, right? Okay, a whole lot of shaking going on. That's the picture. There's a whole lot of shaking going on in Israel. God's people, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. And Letty says, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. We live in a world that is filled with shakable things. We live in a world that is being shaken. But God has provided for us one thing in this life, in this world, that will never be shaken. And that is his unfailing love for you and for me. There is one thing you can hold to. There is one thing in this life that you can have confidence in. And that confidence is in God, whose unfailing love will never be shaken. Good news. Good news in a world filled with trouble. You can bank on it. You can take it to the bank. It is good, and that is our confidence. And with God, just one word. He can just raise his voice. He can just speak, and the earth begins to melt. You know, Jesus demonstrated this. He showed this is true. He got on a boat with his disciples, and they went out into the middle of the sea somewhere. About that time, this massive storm hits, right? And it is crazy. The wind just begins to whip like crazy, and the waves are crashing against the boat, rocking it. Have you ever been on a boat that's doing this? My wife and I on our honeymoon, we got on this catamaran, big one, and it had been raining, and it was, it was and, and the, man, the storm, the, 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 it wasn't storming anymore, but the seas were choppy, and I mean, it was like, pow, pow. It was, and people were puking everywhere. It was not a pretty sight. So Jesus is on this boat, and the disciples, these are experienced fishermen, and they are freaking out because of this storm, what's going on. The wind is going crazy. The waves are crashing, coming over the sides of the boat, filling the boat. They're freaking out, and they turn and look, and Jesus is back in the corner having a little nap. And they're freaked out. They're in fear. They have no confidence. And they're like, Jesus! Don't you care that we're going to die here? And what did Jesus do? He gets up. And he speaks. He says, peace, be still. Immediately, immediately, he speaks. The earth melts. The wind dies down. And the waves go calm. The God we serve, this is the confidence we have. This is our God who can speak to the storms of our life at any moment, at any time, and it melts away before him. Such is his power and authority. And he will speak for us. He will stand on our behalf. Don't forget who stands on your behalf. Don't forget who is with you. Don't forget the one who is within you. Don't forget who your God is, what he has done for you. Don't forget what he has promised. Don't forget the provision that he has given to us. Don't forget the power that he has demonstrated for us. Listen, hear me, hear me, church. Stay confident in your Savior. Because the writer of Hebrews says this. See, they were having some problems. 
They were facing some difficulties. They were going through some storms. They were dealing with persecution. And the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Don't throw it away. See, that's what they were doing. They were like, man, this is, I just don't know it's worth it. And they were ready to throw away their confidence in God. And the writer's like, no, don't do that. Remember God. Remember who he is. Remember what he's done for you. Remember his gracious provision, his power, and his love for you. Don't throw away your confidence because it's going to be richly rewarded. And I want to say to you today, don't throw away your confidence in Christ because it will be richly rewarded. You see, God is no more in the habit of letting his children down any more than you and I are. And the thing is, if we're honest as parents, we have failed at times. We're not perfect. But God never fails. He always does what he promises to do. And I want to remind you that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him, who believe believe that he is, that he exists, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So don't throw away your confidence. And then he closes this portion of the psalm with these final words. Listen to what he says. It's a confession. I think we're going to do this as a confession today as we wrap up. He says, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. What is he saying here? Because he repeats this at the end of this psalm. The Lord Almighty is with us. You will notice that the word Lord is capitalized, right? The reason it's capitalized is because it's using the covenant name of God, Yahweh. Yahweh is the covenant God, the great I am, the self-sufficient one. I am that I am, okay? So the great I am, the self-sufficient one, the covenant God, Yahweh, the Lord Almighty, that is a translation that helps it to connect with the New Testament as well, but it also means the Lord of hosts. That Yahweh, the covenant God, the self-sufficient, is also the all-powerful one who rules and reigns, who is sovereign over all of creation, all right? Now, what does that say to us? Listen to what it's saying. The Lord Almighty, Yahweh, the covenant God, the great I Am, who is sovereign over all creation, is with us. He's with us. You're not alone. You're not facing your challenges alone. God is with us. And this is why we have confidence. The God of Jacob, what is that? The God of Jacob is a reference to the covenant God and God's covenant people. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He is our shelter. I want us to say this as a confession. But listen, don't just say the words. Don't just mouth the words. Don't just repeat the words. Muster up every little bit of faith that you have and say it with confidence that the Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Say it in the face of your trouble. Say it in the face of your storm. Say it in the middle of the worst circumstances in your life you may be facing, but say it and know with confidence that it is absolutely true. Are you ready? The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's say that again. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. God, would you just ingrain this deep in our heart, deep into our spirit, deep into the very depths of our soul until it stops being words on a page and it becomes a reality 
in our life. It becomes an experience in our life where we can say truly with confidence that the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is our confidence. And it is in you. And thank you that you are within us. And you have provided for us streams that make glad the people of God. Thank you that you have provided for us all that we need. Thank you that you come through in the dark times and the moment happens where daybreak happens and you reveal your strong and mighty arm for us. And Father, if there's anyone here today that is struggling, that is going through places of difficulty in darkness, I ask and pray, Father, that you would breathe into them, into their heart, into their spirit, into their life, a new confidence. And it's not based on outcomes, but it is based on you and who you are. That's where our hope is. That's where our trust is. That is where our confidence is. It's in you, Lord. And we thank you for your incredible love for us, that though all the world be shaken, that remains unshaken. Thank you that we have one thing that we can clearly hold to when our world is falling apart, and that's you. We love you, and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to receive communion this morning. Would you go ahead and get your communion cups out? This is the body and the blood of the Lord broken and shed for you and for me. Would you take and eat in remembrance of him? This is the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus, broken and shed for you and for me. Would you take and drink in remembrance of him? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. And Father, we thank you today that Christ is returning. He's coming back for his people. And how our hearts cry and long for that day. But thank you in the meantime that you've not left us alone. You dwell within us. And you have revealed your love to us through Christ. May we hold on to that, I pray, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's good to be with you. Good to be with you online. We love you guys. And uh, we're open, and if you get a chance when you're comfortable, when you're ready, we'd love for you to come back and be with us. Jeff?